Hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ravi Tega, and thank you for joining us for these mini lectures from Kisma Business School. Uh, we've been just going to wait for a couple more seconds before we start off, and I will introduce my guest as well. Uh, thank you once again for joining us, and let's just wait for a few more people to join us. Thank you. All right, let's begin. Hey everyone, my name is Rohit Tigger. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to all of you all. Thank you for joining us for the Gizma Mini Lectures. Uh, today we're going to be uh, today we're going to be talking. Uh, we're going to be have a guest speaker with us, Professor Tilman Lindbergh, who is a who is a uh, professor at the Gizma University, uh, with uh, teaches international business management. Uh, he's going to be taking us to a mini lecture. Uh, and before I hand it over to him, I would like to give us some instructions. Uh, we will be recording the session and we'll be sharing the recording of the session as well. Uh, we're going to do a little things a little differently today. Uh, it's going to be a very interactive session. Uh, two things that's going to happen is one, uh, the professor is going to be asking your questions along with uh, along with that, you can ask our questions to the professor. If you have any questions, leave them in the Q&A section and the professor will answer that at the end of the session. During the session, uh, at any point of the session, he will ask the questions as well. And if and when the professor has any questions, he's going to ask them to you, and you can also interact with him and leave the answers to his questions in the chat box. Uh, so without any further ado, thank you, uh, Professor Lindbergh, uh, Tim Lindbergh, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Yes, thank you, Rohit, for the introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. Yeah, I'm I'm here to give a quick um, mini lecture on the subject make or buy decisions in global supply chain management. And uh, I picked actually a topic that sounds boring, or sounds maybe not so interesting on the first sight, but you will realize that as we go through that, it's actually quite interesting. And that's, with many topics in management, it is like that. The more you really dig into the details, the more you find out that these things actually can be really interesting and can also motivate people uh, to start careers um, in these areas. Um, okay. Um, I would like to um, start very briefly with um, asking you a question, namely, do you know, um, do you still remember these, this iPhone? iPhone 3G um, had a very short life cycle, 2008 to 2010. However, it was a histor historic product. Um, are you still remembering this peculiar phone? Yeah, so if you if you do, please raise your hand. Um, you don't want to answer right now, but you remember it's also fine. Um, I will continue with my next question. Do you remember or do you know who produced this phone? So who produced actually the iPhone? Do you have any information about that? You can leave your question. You can leave your answers in the chat box. Yeah, please write your answer in the chat box, indeed. Rahul, you raised your hand. Yes, please answer. Foxconn. Very good. Yeah, so I don't know whether you searched this out or whether you knew that. Can you quickly explain a bit more, if you just may quickly unmute and, and share a bit about that? Rahul, I'm giving you permission to talk so you can uh, answer. Okay, well, that's fine. Yeah. Um, you can answer the question. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah, no, I did not search Google. I know that uh, iPhones are manufactured by Foxconn on contract mm -hmm. basis. So, hence, I said uh, it is produced by Foxconn. Very good. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, of course, no, it's an Apple, Apple product. Yeah, but Apple has ours. Assembly of the iPhone to a Taiwanese company called Foxconn. 
Yeah, Foxconn has a higher has higher higher annual revenues than um, some countries we are quite familiar with. Yeah, it's really one of the large global electronics. Um, however, it's not just Foxconn involved in the production of, of the iPhone, but actually quite a number of other companies that may partly be familiar with, for instance, Toshiba, for instance, Samsung. Yeah, some wonder why Samsung. Samsung is computer of competitor of Apple, but indeed they are also delivering parts that you that are being assembled by Foxconn uh, iPhone. Yeah, if you look at the major sales of parts for the iPhone, then you of for the 3G, then uh, you have here a list. Some of these companies do not exist anymore. Um, the operation still exists, but they're not part of corporations. Yeah, but Infineon still exists. Um, Samsung, Toshiba, Murata um, still exist. And the other ones these days for more modern type iFi chains are replaced by other companies that similarly source and supply um, uh, components for, for the iPhone. Yes, if you look at the, major, at the list of major suppliers of the iPhone 3G, then again, that's here the list, Toshiba, Samsung, Infineon, Broadcom, you see there from all over the world, Japan, Korea, uh, USA, um, and Germany, interesting enough. Um, and you see that uh, these parts built in are some technical elements that you need to build a kind of smartphone from flash memory over kind of yeah, signaling technology, Bluetooth, um, camera technology, et cetera. And, um, so looking at the value of each of these parts, you realize that overall you have about um, yeah, quite a number of added value of the production of your iPhone that doesn't go to Foxconn, not to Apple, but goes to suppliers all around the globe. Yeah, so if you look at this table, you see at the bottom, there's an um, um, indication of rest of component suppliers. And these are a number of other suppliers with, with even larger, uh, sorry, with even smaller fractions per component, but all they are needed in the end to build an iPhone. And um, now ex exactly Foxconn is the company that assembles these phones. Um, it's actually the world large phonics manufacturer founded already in the 1970s. If you look at the top, you see it's called um, industries, Hon Hein Precision Industry Groups coming out from the mechanical age, but nowadays you know it better on, under the name um, Foxconn um, or Hon Hein Technology um, Group. They are the main manufacturer for brands like Apple, Microsoft, when you talk about Microsoft hardware, Amazon, you may know some Amazon hardware like the Kindle and the, 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 um, the Echo, etc. HP, Intel, IBM, Dell, Sony, Nintendo, I could continue the list. Quite a number of big names actually have contracts for manufacturing with Foxconn. And Foxconn itself operates factories in over 24 countries, um, majorly in China, but um, not only. Yeah, if you have looked in the news, you, you may have you may be informed that right now there's a big move going on from China away to, for instance, Mexico and other countries um, a bit more with um, a bit further away from the kind of conflict, from the political conflict that we see in China happening. And um, all that is orchestrated again by Foxconn, a Taiwanese company. Also, hand raised. Um, who raised the hand? Let me quickly see. Alsha, yes, please. Uh -huh. Akshay, this was, is this meeting based on UNESCO? Uh, Akshay, the, uh, the session is organized by Gizma. Yes, the Gizma, Gizma session here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Falcon actually, um, runs again a couple of factories all around the globe. One of them in Changsu in China, um, also called iPhone City. That's where, where the majority of the world production iPhone 
still comes from, again, right now, there are a lot of plans to shift production to the globe. You may have also heard that there have been some scandals around labor conditions, etc. However, it is indeed the place where most likely your iPhone when you bought one. Yeah, not only the, the 3G, but also all the different um, types afterwards. So um, the interesting thing is, if you now look at the overall bill of components that goes into the iPhone, um, and then you look at the manufacturing costs, yeah, the assembly of the iPhone in China um, by Foxconn, then you see that action of added value being added to the phone in China is rather still considering the overall manufacturing costs. Yeah, so you have here 172, 46 US dollars um, component costs per iPhone 3G. And then we have an added value of assembly only of six dollar fifty, um, and this is sort of like the earnings that um, or the revenues that Foxconn is doing per phone. So the overall costs per iPhone produced are one hundred seventy eight ninety six, and now let's say it's a five hundred dollar phone being sold for five hundred dollars, and then we can imagine already where does majority of the added value go to? That's what our next slide shows. This is sort of saying now the value chain. If you see it, you see here four different sections on this um, value chain map. On the one hand, you have China at the top. That's where the assembly of the phone is happening. You have on the left side, the rest of the world that encompasses all other countries except USA where components are being sourced from for one iPhone 3G. Um, and then you see on the right side, the USA where Apple headquarters is, but also where some component managers are seated. And you see now actually trade relationships happening between China and numerous countries around the globe, but also the USA. Um, on the level of components, the so components are being exported to China from the rest of the world. The value of these components here is $161.71. And you have components being exported from the States to China. The value of these components is $10.75. Yeah, where now in China, the family is happening, the phone is assembled into um, the ready-made product. It's being exported then again to the rest of the world for overall production value of $178.96. Here, the rest of the world is the global market or the global markets uh, where iPhones are being sold. This is quite interesting to see, specifically as now when you look at the payments. Revenues now come from the markets all around the globe, $500. To Apple overseas, yeah, and then Apple overseas, so to say, pays the supply chain, pays the suppliers, and the uh, the rest revenue, the earnings that Apple has per iPhone are three hundred dollar, sorry, three hundred twenty one dollar and four cents. Yeah, so this is quite an interesting perspective because what you see here is a global value chain. Um, or a global supply chain, but you see also a global value chain, how value is added to various manufacturing steps um, um, by companies on the globe that connected through the production of one peculiar product. Um, I hope you can understand this map because I would like to ask you now another question. You see now Apple, basically makes most money of the, of the iPhone, obviously. Yeah, the overall cost of production, 178.96. Yeah, and the profit for Apple is 321 and four cents. Um, and I would like to ask you, do you think this is justified? The fair share that Apple is getting of the dollars a customer pays for the iPhone? Do you think it's too much? Do you think it's a fair share or do you possibly even think it's too little? I would like to get a little perspective on that.
Uh, would anybody would like to answer that question? Yeah, again, the question is, looking at this distribution of value over the global value chain behind the, the Apple iPhone 3G production um, and the supply chain, um, would you say it's fair for Apple to get more than 50% of the overall value made with one iPhone? 321 compared to 179. Yes, Rahul, you say it's fairly priced. Um, why would you say so? Why do you think it's a fair price? I would be interested in your thing. Why do you think it's a fair price? Do you have any thoughts on that? Raul, would you like to speak on the mic? Right, so you're saying, what about marketing? Yeah, and actually, it's not only marketing, it's also research. And yeah, these $321 pay not only for the production of the iPhone, but also for basically all the marketing efforts that Apple puts into their brand. And they are quite extensive. You may be aware that Apple is one of the most valuable brands all around the globe. This, of course, is supported by tremendous marketing efforts. However, you also know Apple is a, is a technology brand and technology always means that you have high investments into research and development and also design. And the whole Apple experience, as you know, is not linked just about the hardware, but about the software that they actually deliver for free. Usually, yeah, you know that Apple software, you don't pay for that. It's something that you can, you can just use. So all this is covered by, by these three net revenue, three, three net $21 per iPhone value for Apple, gross profit for Apple, plus, of course, their profit. Um, they also have to make a profit at the end. So indeed, it's a fair price considering that marketing and R&D plus design are also covered by this amount. Um, and understanding this, um, or to understand this, it's quite interesting to look at Porter's value chain model. Porter's value chain is something you may be familiar with. It's quite of the classic, um, typical models you discuss in strategic management, but also in marketing. And what it actually does, it kind of slices a company up in different functions and distinguishes here into primary and support activities. Now, what are primary activities? Primary activities are those that the company performs to actually deliver a product or service to a customer. Yeah, this is the value production company. So we talk about products here. Yeah, we need the inbound logistics to get our raw materials, our components in. We need our operations where we machine, uh, where, we, where we produce with our machines and we assemble and we do our Q&A testing, et cetera. We do our outbound logistics where we now ship products to customers or to distributors or warehouses. We need marketing and sales that does advertisement um, and basically gets in touch with, with the retailers or with the customers directly, depending on what your channels look, look like. And you also do after sales service, which is specifically important if you have more expensive products, like for instance, cars or any car, or any product that may also break down throughout this life cycle to ensure that yeah, customers, even if something happens, can still enjoy the product that they bought. Yeah, so all these activities are linked to actually delivering value for customers. But you're also aware that this is not everything a company is doing. You have HR departments. Yeah, you have people sitting into purchasing, uh, working on purchasing. You have people who manage the infrastructure, the fleet, yeah, the, the, the houses, etc. And you have R&D, technology development 
which is not directly delivered with production or with the product because you think you're more into the future, but not in the present supply chains. So which of these support activities do you really need? That's the big point here. Um, and the core question is, um, do they help you in delivering better products and services for customers? If yes, if they help you to deliver better products and services for customers, yeah, then the job well, otherwise they may be overhead where we can focus on efficiency here. However, if you now think about Apple supply chain, you realize that only very few of these company functions actually are performed by Apple itself. Yeah, I would like to ask you again, which of these functions, you see here company infrastructure, human resource management, technology development, procurement, logistics, operations, marketing, sales, service. Yeah, which of these things are done by Apple itself and which of them do you think are mainly outsourced? Exactly, yeah. research and development handled by Apple, and they would never outsource that because that's some of their core features to create value for customers. Yeah, R&D, and also marketing, actually. Marketing is something Apple would not outsource, at least not the strategic part of that. Is this because marketing and R&D actually are the main levers for um, creating value for customers and creating willingness to pay um, for customers. Yeah. However, you realize that operations are outsourced, logistics are outsourced, yeah, HR for their own parts are not outsourced, but once you outsource your operations, your factories, etc., then you also don't have to care about these parts of hiring workers, etc. So all these elements basically are outsourced to contractors here, like for instance, Foxconn, and Apple focuses really on these areas that they are not only the best, but have to be best in, in order to um, leverage willingness to pay for customers. Yeah, so here you see, um, Apple has had a discussion, where are the functions that are of most strategic importance for us? Where are our business functions that actually contribute to the highest willingness to pay of customers? And those are that we do in-house. Everything else where we do not see basically a strong lever coming from for the willingness of customers, we outsource. Yeah, and this then looks like exactly the, this, um, like this value chain model we looked at. We have outsourced uh, production to China. Um, we have outsourced components to the rest of the world. However, we focus on R&D and we focus on marketing and the rest is basically coordination of a global supply chain around our products and around the iPhone 3G. Um, this model supports that. This is the so-called smile curve. The smile curve now is actually part of as value chain. We just looked at that. However, spread around the globe. You see how certain activities are linked rather to a developed country, like for instance, the States. And others are linked more to developing countries or also to emerging economies. Yeah, you can't speak about India like a developing country, but it's an emerging economy, likewise China was, and or Vietnam and Philippines, and you see a lot of outsourcing of production going on to developing or to emerging countries, yeah, whereas R&D traditionally by Western companies held in such um, countries um, like st the States or Germany. This is a classical logic of outsourcing decisions that, for instance, drives the iPhone 3D supply chain. Wherever lower added value contributions are coming from, 
whatever has a lower contribution to the willingness to pay of customers, this is being outsourced and we focus here on efficiency. And that what has higher added value to the willingness to pay of customers, this is being insourced more or less. We do it basically in very strong development partnerships in close proximity often um, in our home countries. Yeah, and this is exactly what us R&D, marketing, yeah, design, those things are insourced and purchasing decision production. Um, this is outsourced countries specifically with the intention to take advantage of lower cost structures in countries like, for instance, China. Um, this drives, of course, not all outsourcing decisions. Yeah, we see in, in Apple supply chain that they also collaborate with some suppliers in high cost countries like, for instance, Germany or even South Korea. Why would they do that? Because here they have to tap into the techno technological knowledge that these companies have. Yeah, Samsung, for instance, has certain um, touchscreen technologies that Apple needs. Yeah, uh, likewise, Infineon produces certain chips that Apple needs. Yeah, so here you collaborate with suppliers that have the technology that Apple needs. However, kind of this whole cost argument, yeah, tries to identify those added value steps that have a lower contribution to the willingness to pay of customers and outsource them to um, low cost destinations. Um, this curve also interesting because it shows also a pathway for economic development for countries. This is, for instance, the China story. China, over the last three de decades, focused specifically on production, but step by step engaged also with higher added economic value activities, like, for instance, design, R&D, marketing, and services. Yeah, so they used the time of being the so-called workbench of the world to learn very intensive on technology, specifically future, future technologies, and now companies that are able to compete globally also on the higher economic value activities and therefore change the whole dynamics of China as an economic powerhouse or as an economy. As an economy. Yeah, so, and this is true for every country. Every country first usually once it grows through participation in global supply chains or, or in global value chains, um, enters usually through production and then has to see how can we add more higher added value activities to our production activities in order to get also larger parts of the overall value of supply chains uh, in our companies and in our countries. Um, Okay, so this was Apple's supply chain and Apple has to make a choice. How do we want to compete on the market? And every company actually has to make a bit of a different choice. Some go by costs, they go by the cheapest price and others go by certain differentiation factors that make them outstanding in the market. And Apple, for instance, strongly focuses on innovation, yeah? And also network and platform technology. Yeah, here are so to see some strong USP, unique selling propositions that Apple has developed over the years. Yeah, and whatever again does not support this business strategy in our supply chain, that's something we can really outsource to third party providers that may be better. And that that's not the area how we win our market. That's simply something we have to manage, and we manage this with outsourced decisions. Other companies, yeah, if you for instance look at Walmart. They focus more on costs. So whatever decisions they make, they focus on the kind of low structures because they work towards the discounting in these discounting real areas. Yeah, other companies, for instance, like Mercedes, we talk about automotive, they focus on quality, but also innovation yeah, and service. So whatever stands in the foreground, that's what you usually do in-house because you need to be good at that and also develop expertise here. Um, while other things that you don't really need to win on the market, you can outsource to suppliers. Um, so my decisions are um, therefore linked with quite a number of uh, different terms and terminologies. Outsourcing basically means when we transfer a certain activity to a third party provider, yeah, and the insourcing is just the opposite. When we try to do a certain activity in-house, 
Um, offshoring means something else. Then outsourcing offshoring means that we go to a country far away, usually with the intention of tapping into lower cost structures, yeah, cost country advantages. Reshoring now, that's what you can observe a lot, um, together with nearshoring. Nearshoring means that we undo offshoring decisions. Yeah, we take production locations from far away countries and to closer countries, for instance, from the German perspective, you may first outsource to Chinese, uh, to China, and then you decide to reshore to Poland. Poland is geographically much, much closer by than China, but it's still another country, it's still offshoring in a sense. Yeah, you know, it's, it's still kind of cross country outsourcing, but um, it has a bit of an idea of nearshoring. Yeah, if you reshore, then you, however, go back in your own country. Yeah, so, so nearshoring Poland, reshoring back in my own country. Omnishoring is an approach that you choose to um, work with uh, multiple suppliers. Multi-sourcing is also a word here. And you do this usually to reduce the dependency on peculiar suppliers, but also the dependency on peculiar regions. For instance, if all your suppliers are in China, and then China decides on some zero COVID policies, yeah, then if you have an omnishoring model, you can shift easier production from China to other countries. But if you have like a kind of uh, model that only starts from one company, one country, then you have a much more dependent also on political developments in these areas. Um, interesting is that um, in sourcing, uh, sorry, outsourcing and offshoring are actually two different things. I mentioned that. Yeah. Outsourcing means that you hand over an activity of your production process to a third party provider. And offshoring means that you do it in an overseas or in a faraway location. Yeah. So, of course, you can outsource to a company in your home country, that's a home location. This would be like outsourcing without offshoring. You can also, however, outsource and offshore. Yeah, then you look for a, a supplier somewhere far away um, um, to be included in your supply chain. Usually, then you make yourself dependent on shipping lines and ocean shipping, etc. But you can also think about off offshoring without outsourcing. So, insourcing and offshoring. This happens when companies invest into other countries far away and set up their own factories over there. Uh, Apple hasn't done that because production of an iPhone is not of strategic importance to them. But um, if you now move to automotive, BMW would not do that. They are, would have difficult times outsourcing their production facilities, at least their core facilities. Why is that? Because in their production are also parts of the levers yeah, that contribute significantly to the willingness to pay of customers. So um, just to get, give you a bit overview about the different choices that companies have, and let's indeed now move to automotive. You know that uh, Germany is a country uh, that focuses a lot on automotive. Automotive has a strong um, significance in this country and for this economy over here. And BMW is a company you, you all know. Here at the bottom, you see actually the Q&A, one of the test stands in the um, BMW factory here in Munich. Uh, on the left side, you see a picture of this factory here, the, uh, this tower, that's where the headquarters are, that's where the CEO and the board members sit. And in these different halls and buildings, that's where actually BMW production is happening. Yeah, the, this, the actually map is on the right side. Yeah, you see here some German words on the map, but uh, the English words are written in these bullet points. You have here machine and machining of engine components and engine assembly is being done by BMW at their on the factory side. Seat production is done by them. Press shop is done by them. Yeah, where the so this is the metals are pressed into the forms that you need for the car body. The body shop, yeah, where the different uh, metals are now connected to the overall car body. The paint shop, where the painting, the coating is being done, plus also the vehicle assembly. Yeah, so the, the overall putting together of the final car. Um, those are in-sourced activities. 
And these activities, BMW would not outsource at all. Why is that? Because they contribute essentially to the willingness to pay off customers. Yeah, the way how the cars look, the way how the engine performs, yeah, the way how the finish of the car is, that's one of their core strengths. And they need to protect these strengths in order to keep um, being successful on the market. However, when you look at the supply chain of BMW, you see that quite a number of components are outsourced. Yeah, so all these gray steps here are insourced. However, all these white steps here are outsourced. And you see that although motor block casting, engine assembly, um, yeah, gear production, um, axle gear production are insourced, you have the gearbox, for instance, coming from suppliers. You have the raw materials, aluminum, coil, um, coming um, from suppliers. You have a lot of body components. Yeah, for instance, the bumpers and the, the, the windows and the, um, the, the mirrors, the side mirrors and uh, the light systems and the in-car entertainment system and et cetera. Yeah, kind of hundreds of different components are outsourced to suppliers. Yeah, paint, ceiling material, et cetera. And um, across the different steps, you have inflows of outsourced components that BMW has to include in the production and into the final vehicle assembly. Um, this means that BMW is at the core of quite a complex supply chain that combines insourcing and outsourcing and that requires close coordination between the different participants in the supply chain. Here's an example, for instance, how front lamps are sourced from um, a supplier. Yeah, but these suppliers, of course, source again from other suppliers, the LED units. Yeah, and the LED units, however, again, require sourcing from a third supplier, yeah, the PCB boards. And the PCB boards require some microchips to build them together to a proper um, LED ba basis for LED unit production from a fourth supplier. Yeah, and this is quite typical that you have different tiers of suppliers, first tier, second tier, third tier, fourth tier supplier, and quality issues or volume issues, no matter where along these different steps can cause hiccups yeah, and even production stops across the whole supply chain. So coordination here is really essential. Um, but again, you see that BMW focuses on those parts that they consider as most essential to the overall quality of the product and to winning on the market, to the willingness to pay of the customers, whereas those elements that may not have the strongest or like a more smaller or marginal contribution to the willingness to pay is outsourced to um, third party providers yeah, across the different tiers. Um, yeah, before I come to a closure for this mini lecture, I would like to show you here a very interesting graph. Yeah, this is not BMW. This actually is now USA, Detroit. You may know that Detroit is not only a city in the USA, but it's also a hub for automotive production, where all three big American car manufacturers, Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors have the headquarters. And you see here that um, they um, have a number of suppliers. Every dot you see on this list actually is one of the supplies they have in their supply chain. And these yellow dots are the first tier suppliers, those that directly ship to Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, yeah, to the so-called OEMs. And these first tier suppliers again have second tier, third tier and fourth tier suppliers. And those are all the other dots you see here, plus also some global supplies that ship, so to say, from far away. On this map, however, you see quite a geographical concentration of supply chains. If you now compare this to what Apple is doing, Apple talks about the global spread of suppliers. Yeah? Global supply chain is really at the core of the Apple of the iPhone production process. Yeah? However, in car manufacturing, you won't find the same spread of um, globalization in the supply chains. Yes, certain components come from far away, but others usually come from closer geographical proximity. Yeah, and this is 
something that has to do with concepts like just in time or just in sequence. Now, you may be aware that um, companies, once they produce larger components or also more expensive components in production, that they try to reduce warehousing costs by having suppliers delivering components just in time, yeah, at the day, even at the kind of time window of production, which means like your supplier, your first year supplier um, ships the bumpers at the day of production yeah, to the assembly line of, let's say, Chrysler or BMW, so that you can reduce your warehousing costs yeah, and also reduce your capital employed, so it has some cost advantages. Yeah, and this, of course, requires short distance supply chains where you would rather um, see um, suppliers in your direct neighborhood, um, because then, of course, the, the continuous transportation of goods and components is easier to manage than if you have longer distance to bridge. However, also automotive includes long distance supply chains, but then usually for smaller components like screws and nuts and bolts and kind of these kinds of things um, that, um, um, that are often a bit more standardized and have a lower added value, lower investment, lower production costs, but also again, uh, do not require so much space to store, to store them in large numbers. Yeah, and these components, automotive suppliers would engage also with kind of outsourcing, with offshoring to other countries to take advantage of low cost destinations. Yeah, but you see here again, a supply chain very differently organized than Apple's. Yeah, and this is actually what I, what, how I want to close that in the end, yeah, you need to understand where do, how do companies win on the market? Yeah, how do the products that they design and develop actually compete with other competitors in the market? And out of this, you then start designing a supply chain. For Apple, the answer is outsourcing everything except marketing and R&D. Yeah, for BMW, the answer is to focus on those parts of the assembly that are most, most obvious to the customers while outsourcing and cost optimizing those parts that are not so essential for the willingness to pay of customers. Yeah, fashion again works different. Yeah, food again works different. But for each industry, you have to understand how do I convince my customers to pay money to my product? And from there, you start designing and developing your supply chain. Okay, thank you very much. And I would be now open for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Tillman. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we are now open to questions. So if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you can leave them in the Q&A section. And the, the professor will ask them for you. Are there any questions? I think there's no question coming. Um, then thank you very much for your attention. Um, from my side, and I would, yeah, oh, then- Oh, got a question. And, okay, how are the job prospects in the field of supply chain and logistics? Um, yes, um, that's a good question, actually. You know, it depends a bit on your background. The interesting thing is then if you want to work in the area of supply chain management, there's not a clear path into that field. You can come from management side, you can come from engineering side, but you have to have an interest on that. Generally, the job op op uh, opportunities are very good yeah, because supply chain management is required by almost every company except you are entirely digital. But wherever you are in retail on production or even kind of have kind of delivery services, especially like this supply chain management is really at the heart of the of the business. And the more you understand how it works, the more um, um, the more you also make yourself suitable for these jobs. 
Yeah, so there are quite a number of job opportunities for that. Um, however, you have to prepare yourself and there's not a clear education that you can pick to get there. So it's more by showing interest, by engaging with the subject and also by picking, in, by picking internships. Plus, when you're interested in supply chain these days, it makes a lot of sense to focus also a bit about Python programming, for instance, and going into these IT routines um, because a lot of digitalization is happening in the field of supply chain management right now. And as a manager, as an SCM manager, you have to understand a bit how this works. So I can really recommend to focus also a bit, not, you don't have to be an expert on that, but understand a bit how, how, for instance, Python works is definitely helpful. Generally, I can say supply chain management is a really interesting job because it does not only um, cross, crosses all business functions, yeah, from logistics, operations, marketing, sales, um, strategic management, yeah, kind of every finance, everything is included, but you also engage very heavily with the suppliers and this often goes global. So you're quite involved with the international part of business. So it's quite an interesting um, job to be in. Again, if you pre prepare your profile well, and this is by picking the right courses and making the right choices for internships, but also just putting your interest in that, yeah, then um, you make yourself attractive in an area where a lot of people are being needed. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Dillman. I have a question before we wind up. Uh, yeah. My question is, how lucrative is uh, the job prospects uh, for doing this question? How lucrative is a, is a job in the supply chain management? Like, what's the average uh, salary that a person can look at? I mean, for example, in Germany itself, what would be the average salary that a person who does a supply chain management or works in the supply chain management would earn? Okay, so I can't give you now exact... Um salary levels yeah that's that's something you can easily search also with with glass doors etc um or um glass doors here with with uh with um um yeah, job application platforms but what i can say is that um the the more you move into the senior positions the more um they have quite excellent salaries Specifically, when you bring also IT skills with, you know, these people that move from IT into supply chain, they're pretty well paid because they cross two different um, areas that kind of you have to have, have to grasp have have you have, have to have a grasp of both to really bring value to the company. So, um, if you have a bit of an IT background, then moving towards supply chain management can really be an added value, and you can get then easily into the hundred thousand plus. Um, um jobs on the senior level you know however to get there will mean most likely if you possibly not going directly to a development career which is usually higher paid but if you go to logistics career for instance it, this may also entail starting with some jobs that are not um now um above average maybe you have have your uh, somewhere in the fifty thousands or a year euro instead of talking about euro right now or maybe some 49 48 sometimes you have to take these jobs up but those then usually are junior positions that you kind of really take up to learn you know and this is kind of then the jumping board to get to get your career started um but specifically in the intersection between it and supply chain there you get quite interesting salaries uh, so and another thing that I would like to ask is, do you think the prospects or the job opportunities or the value of a supply chain has increased post-COVID? Uh, do you think that uh, COVID has had some kind of, uh, I mean, post-COVID, do you think there's a, a change in demand or increase in demand for supply chain uh, uh, prospect jobs? Um, uh, there's definitely a shift in the demands on the job profile. Uh, which also means that the type of supply chain jobs have shifted. Um, what you see, for instance, there are a couple of trends post COVID that really play a role here. The first is digitalization, um, but also the whole integrating the online, the offline world through all these delivery systems, yeah, the, these delivery services that kind of are really booming, specifically post COVID. Um, but um, you have also uh, the whole question of 
supply chain resilience. So how can we create more resilient supply chains that are not so um, easily kind of brought to, um, to their knees through uh, political events in certain countries, but even through pandemics. So this whole question of nearshoring or reshoring or even omnishoring is something that plays now much more of a role than it did um, uh, before COVID started. Um, however, um, production of most products is global and a supply chain management of most products is global. Yeah, which means you need the people with the global skills in these areas. Nevertheless, yeah, this hasn't reduced. Talk about tourism, this has this may have reduced, yes, but supply chain management hasn't reduced. Yeah, we have we still produce all around the globe and the ship products all around the globe. Um, however, the structure of supply chains has shifted and the demands on the job has shifted. So, in short, my answer would be um, the prospects have not um or like the, the, the need for supply chain management has not changed, yeah, but the, um, the uh, profile of the jobs has changed with a stronger focus on IT and with a stronger focus on um, resilience. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Professor Tillman. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we will be having a next session on the 29th of uh, June, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, please look into your, uh, please stay uh, tuned to our emails to get more information about the upcoming uh, sessions as well, mini lectures as well from Gizma. Uh, thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Professor Tillman Lindbergh, for joining us, and have a great day. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Have a, enjoy yourself, and take care. Bye-bye. Okay, goodbye.